it's great to be here, and you're going to get to do some of the work as well. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, the book of Job, and we're going to try and look at the entire book of Job. And you think, oh, that's not possible. I've listened to the entire book of Job over the last 24 hours, you know, and I've been doing other things at the same time. But you can play audio of these sort of things all, all the time. And, you know, so while I'm shaving, you know, have got the book of Job on, or maybe it's some other book I had on uh, at the time. Um, so let's uh, open our Bibles or switch them on if that's appropriate for you. And we're going to look at Job chapter 1 and we're going to read the whole chapter. I like big readings from Scripture because it means that however bad my talk is, people still benefit from the Bible. Uh, so uh, let's hear what God has to say. There was a man in the land of Uz. By the way, Uz is a real place and it's attested outside the Bible. Whose name was Job... And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of all of them. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased, uh, he's increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said, Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell on them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of the Lord fell from the earth and burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups, and made a raid on the camels, and took them, and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness, and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they're dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job rose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell on the ground, and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Incredible passage, isn't it? Just incredible. Well, I've not suffered like that. But I'm really glad there's a book like this in the Bible. And it's real. This isn't fiction. Now, some people think that the numbers are so neat that, hey, it must be real. Because at the end of the book, he's going to have double the number of cattle exactly. You know. Well, what's, can anyone help me? What's the proportion between sheep, the ratio between sheep and sons? Ratio between sheep and sons. Anyone tell me that? Raise a hand. Thousand to one. 
What's the ratio between camels and daughters? Anyone? Sorry? A thousand to one. In other words, the numbers look really neat, and people say, hey, that means it's just a story, it didn't happen. I say, the problem with that way of looking at things is you're going to find exactly the same in the New Testament. I'm reading Luke 13, and I will read about a tower that fell on 18 people, and then there's a woman who's been ill for 18 years. Or I'll read Mark, and I'll have a girl who's age 12, and a woman who's been ill for 12 years, right next door to each other. So if I'm going to say it's too neat, you know that, Me that terrible earthquake in Mexico took place 32 years to the day to the last one they had. You know, sometimes history falls into patterns and God is in control of things. So let's not use the fact that things are neat as a reason not to think that they're real. So what happens? Who is this guy? Well, verse 1 tells us he's a guy called Job. And he is described in two ways. He feared God and he turned away from evil. Now that is a fascinating description. I want you to memorize that. Feared God, turned away from evil. Because that, in fact, is the ultimate in wisdom. Let's look on to um, the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? End of the book of Ecclesiastes. You think, why are we going to Ecclesiastes? I thought we were doing Job. Well, Ecclesiastes builds up to a climax, doesn't it? This guy, Solomon, he looks at the world and he works out what's what. And what's his conclusion after he's done all of his investigations? His conclusion is this. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments as the whole duty of man. In other words, a great summary of the entire book. Fear God, turn away from evil, keep his commandments. Or when we look at the book of Proverbs, and the book of Proverbs summarizes what wisdom is. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. In other words, this is a really good summary of what it is to do the right thing. And his concern is what? That his children might have cursed God. There is this day, and we don't really understand this, it's mysterious, when Satan appears before God. Now, God's presence is hard to understand because God's presence is obviously, he's present everywhere, otherwise things wouldn't be running, would they? But also, we know he's separate from sin. And we know that he's present everywhere, but he's specially present in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament. And he's specially present in Christ, and he's specially present in our hearts, and he's specially present when two or three are gathered together. So in other words, God's um, presence, there's special presence and there's presence everywhere okay and somehow satan is coming into god's presence we don't understand that what's satan been doing satan has been traveling he's actually been doing a world tour he's been going around every single bit of the world so it means he's got a pretty good idea about the people on the world and god says have you thought about job job fears god and he turns away from evil. Aha! Satan's got an answer. That's because he's got such a nice life. You know, if you stop his life being nice, you know what he's going to do? He's going to curse you. Well, he says, okay, you can do everything, but you can't touch his person. And you saw the timing of that, that those four disasters, four often a number of universality, total disaster comes upon him. Every bit of cattle he got, and the climax he loses those seven sons and those three daughters. The perfect numbers you can imagine. The individuals. And the news comes back to back. One is still speaking. The next one comes in. And how does he respond? Well, he's gutted. He tears his robes. He shaves his head. He is really, really hurt. He, he cared so much about his children that he would rise early every day. Every day he got up early because he was concerned about his kids. This is the guy who loved those kids deeply. And when he hears this, he says this, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord's taken away. Cursed? No, 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 no. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, Satan lost the challenge. 
round two. Chapter two, a little bit briefer. There's another day. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his skin. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said, Behold, he's in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself, and he sat on the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Just get it over and done with. Curse him. And he answered her, and this is a great answer. It's not you fool, nothing like that. You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. He doesn't call his wife a fool. He just says that the way she's speaking currently, uh, it was in the same category as a foolish woman would speak. See, in other words, it's a lot more respectful, isn't it, you see? Uh, and, and guys, think about that. You know, um, I wouldn't actually use this line yourself, uh, but just think about um, the way that, the things that you imply uh, is, uh, anyway, there we are. Um, you can meditate on this verse. And uh, he says, shall we receive God, uh, a good from God, and not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now notice, after round two, he doesn't bless God. He doesn't curse God. He doesn't bless God. See? He's in too much pain. Too much pain, too much physical pain. Now, along come some friends. Now, these friends, ladies and gentlemen, are real friends. No, they really, really are. I know they're often portrayed as not real friends. How do we know they're real friends? Well, one, they come a long way. Two, when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. They raised their voices and wept, and they uh, tore their robes, sprinkled their dust on their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was great. They were friends, and I want to say this, they were sensitive. I know you don't think they're sensitive. They were. They saw his pain, and that's why they kept quiet for seven whole days. So they're friends. But they're friends with wrong ideas about the way the world works and how much they know. You come to chapter 3. And what does Job do in chapter 3 and verse 1? Does he curse God? No, he curses something. It's not God, though. He curses the day of his birth. And he goes through a series of questions. And, but he says, let that day perish. And he's got a series of questions. Now, I want you to answer me this question. And I'm going to need, because the auditorium, you need to shout out loud. What is the most common question word he uses in this chapter? Okay, just scan through chapter 3. Job chapter 3, what's the most common question word? You know, the who, when, where, what, how, why. Which is the most common question word we get? Why? Absolutely. There it is in verse 11, verse 13, 12, sorry. Verse 16, verse 20, verse 23. Why, 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 why? Now, his friends think they've got the answer. It's because you're doing something wrong. And so... There is a round, there's actually two and a half rounds of exchange between him and his friends. We're not going to go into that. But their danger is they thought they knew the answer. <coughs> it doesn't comfort Job at all. In fact, it rather upsets him. We're going to flick on, because how, how else are we going to get through 42 chapters in such a short time, to Job chapter 28. And this is where Job is giving his roundup summary. And this is what you need to remember. Job 28, 28. Can anyone remember Job 28, 28? Job 28, 28. I mean, that's the number, 28, 28. This is the summary he puts to it. God said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. What do we learn in Job 1, 1? He's a man who fears the Lord and he turns away from evil. And when he gets to his climax on, it's a whole poem, Job 28, on, and he's got 28 verses, on how do you find wisdom? That's it. Fear the Lord 
and turn away from evil. He says a bit more. And then there's a guy called Elihu who comes along. Uh, chapter 32 through to 37. You think, what, what are we to make of him? Is what he says good or is what he says bad? Well, he's Elihu, son of Barakel, uh, which means something like uh, lightning of, of God. Uh, and he's a fiery character. He's a younger guy than the rest. And uh, he is angry that Job's friends have tried to say you've done something wrong and they couldn't actually convict him of that. But he's also angry with Job and uh, he thinks he's got it rather more sorted out. But there's an interesting thing that happens as you get to chapter 37. This is towards the end of Elihu's speech. You see Elihu, he's got six chapters to speech, uh, through from 32 to 37, and you'll say suddenly that there's lots of talk about the weather. Something's going on with the weather. Chapter 37 and verse 2, keep listening to the thunder of his voice, the rumbling that comes from his mouth under the whole heaven. And it talks about the lightning and the thunders, verse 4, and the thunders, verse 5, snow, verse 6, and so on. It goes on, and it's so much about weather. And when you get to Genesis, uh, sorry, not Genesis, uh, Job chapter 38, you find this that the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And you think, where's the whirlwind? Well, what the whirlwind you're told about is in Elihu's speech. As Elihu's speaking, there's this rumbling going on, and the rumbling's going on louder and louder and louder. And then God speaks to him. And he says, Who's this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? There's a problem with what Job was saying, and that is he didn't actually know that much. Uh, dress for action like a man, and then he asks him a series of, by my count, 82 questions. 82 questions. So, we're looking at the question of, why is Job suffering? And instead of getting an answer to that, you get 82 questions. Does that seem like an answer to suffering? Well, I want you to look down the questions we have in Job chapter 38 and tell me, what's the most common question word? The most common of the who, when, where, what, how, why? Anyone? Who? Interesting, isn't it? Job wants to know why, 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 why? What is the answer to why Job is suffering? Well, the book ends, and it records his death. So presumably it's written, not written by him, it's written after his death. And we don't even know whether he ever knew about this conversation between God and Satan. Right? So, why, at one level, you could answer, because there was a discussion between God and Satan, there was a challenge, and you were part of that. And he may never have known that. So the answer to why is beyond your knowledge. Now, his friends thought they had the answer. It's because you're bad. Why is he suffering? I'll give you another answer. <laughs> Not because he's bad, because he's good. In fact, if he weren't the best person on earth, he wouldn't be in the challenge. <laughs> you know, he is in the challenge between God and Satan precisely because he's so good. <laughs> so he's not suffering because he's bad, he's suffering because he's, in relative human terms, good. That's crazy, isn't it? I mean, how would you think of that? You know, human logic, you're suffering because someone's done something wrong. But actually, the reality is, he's suffering because he's good. Let's answer that question again. Why is he suffering? Well, so we can have the book of Job. <laughs> now, try explaining that to Job. I mean, Job's, Job's a clever guy. I mean, try explaining to him, you are suffering so that the book of Job can be written and people can have comfort from that. That's quite a mind-blowing idea, isn't it? You know, why is he suffering? If you start trying to answer our why questions, you're going to get pretty easily beyond our knowledge, aren't you? So that's why is he suffering. But it's not why is he suffering, is it? How many of you have been comforted by the book of Job? One or two hands? Three hands? Four hands? No, come on, how many of you have been comforted by the book of Job? Come on, don't be shy. How many of you have been comforted by the book of Job, please? Okay. So... Job, the reason you're suffering is so that people in Texas can get comfort. Now, I want you to try and explain that to Job, okay? What is Texas? Hmm. 
Well, it's, it's a place a, a long way over the seas. Like, you'd have to go over the sea, and then there's an even bigger sea. And then you go to a place where there's lots of sort of countries or states that are joined together, but they're like one country, but one nation, and yet they're a bit se separate, particularly Texas. And it's sort of, <laughs> it's big, okay? It's, and, and it's got different parts to it, and, and, and there are people there, and, and, and they're Texans, okay? Fine. And, and uh, there are lots of them, and they believe in Jesus. And uh, who's Jesus? Well, he's your redeemer that you, you, know, you spoke about. I know that my redeemer lives. Oh, yeah, okay, got that. And, and, and they meet together in a church. Uh, what's, what's a church? Uh, and, and you think, how could this guy possibly understand that he is suffering so that hundreds of thousands, possibly millions today, who are hearing sermons on the book of Job, could be comforted? I mean, doesn't that, like totally blow your mind, and, and that there are people in all these countries that he can't even imagine. So the only answer you can get to why you're suffering, you know, Job, is, is, is not even beginning to start. It's thinking about who? Who is in charge? Who are you? And who is God? So what's his first question? Well, it's not a who question, actually. Uh, it's, it's another sort of question. Job 38 verse 4, and I want us to think about this. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the, world, of the earth? Okay, let's just try and get a good answer to that. Um, where were you when God laid the foundations of the earth? Now, I want you to answer that question. Beginning, I was. Okay? Where were you when God laid the foundations of the earth? Anyone want to have a go at it? A sentence, an answer, beginning, I was. You might want to do a sentence beginning, I wasn't, but I think that's, no, I don't want to know where you wasn't. I want to know where you was. Where were you? Well, I wasn't, no, that, that's cheap. I've just done a wasn't. I was not anywhere. I mean, not anywhere. What sort of nonsense are you talking about? Okay, I was a twinkle in your eye, God. Um, maybe. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty mind-blowing question. And the other questions aren't always that difficult. I mean, who determined the measurements? Now, is that a difficult question? No, it's not a difficult question. In fact, he even gives a clue when he answers, asks all these who questions, when he says, uh, who shut the sea in with doors when it burst out of the womb when I made, the, <laughs> uh, made clouds its garments? That's sort of a bit of a clue. So he really is helping him. Uh, you know, who did it? It's you. But our answer to God's question about why, we're su why, why they're suffering is not, it's because of this. It's to think of who God is, how much more he knows than we do, and how, much, how little we know as humans. How could Job possibly get his head around this? Now, let's look back at Job chapter 3, but keep our fingers in Job chapter 38. And this is just why I'm going to show you a little bit about how God does sort of answer the question of why he's suffering. Job chapter 3, verse 6. He's cursing the day of his birth. And he says, let not the day come into the number of the months. You see that? Number of the months. Okay, Job chapter 3, verse 6. Job chapter 3, verse 9. Um, let it not see the eyelids of the dawn. I want you to think, one phrase, number of the months. Second phrase, eyelids of the dawn. Okay? Next phrase, he's saying, it's really nice being dead, because it, at least in the land, land of the dead, or Sheol, uh, in the, amongst the dead, um, what happens in verse 18? The prisoners are at ease together, and they hear not the voice of the taskmaster or the driver. Okay? So that's three phrases. You're thinking, why are you taking us through these? And uh, there is uh, one more, and that is just the mention, you notice there, of Leviathan in verse 8. Now, I want you to notice in God's speech, there are in fact 60 nouns and verbs that come from Job chapter 3 in God's reply. 60. Now, they don't all show up in English translation, but I'm going to show you some of them where they do turn up. So Job 39 and verse 2. It's a different context. Can you number the months? You got it? Number the months. Verse 7, Job 39, verse 7. Nor hear the shouts of the driver. 
Exactly the same phrase. Job 40 and 41 is all about Leviathan. And Job 41 and verse 18 talks about the eyelids of the dawn. And there are lots of other ones in there. So in other words, God does answer Job, but not on his terms. God does answer, but the answer is really who? The answer to all of our questions is to think about God and the fact that we know so little and God knows so much. And so we can't answer the question of why we might be suffering, but we do know that God is there and God is good and God blessed the end of Job and made it far better than the beginning. And God promises that if we are trusting him, that he will bless us, uh, not necessarily in this life, in a material sense, but ultimately, because of Christ, we get to be with him and uh, we get to be in bliss. So that's what I had to share with you. But now I think we've got a time of Q&A and hopefully some Q have come in and we might get some A. Uh, I mean... Q and A, particularly the emphasis is on the Q, not the A, if you see what I mean. Because we're looking at the book of Job and there was Q, if you see what I mean. So the answer to Q was Q. You got that right question? Anyway. Okay. We got some. We just put the number up. Okay. So uh, do texting questions and and type super quick. Um, While while you're doing that, just uh, think about a few more things to do with the book of Job. So when the book of Job ends... um, We don't know what to make of Elihu. Elihu doesn't come into the ending. So we know that Job's three friends were rebuked and Job offered a sacrifice on them. I think Elihu gets let off the hook. He said wrong things, but not as bad because also he's young. Uh, And, but there's there's a message through all of them and that is every single human is deeply lacking in knowledge. Um, And one of the key issues is just how much do you know? And God asks a whole load of scientific questions about how did this happen, who did, who did this. But it's, it's not that they're necessarily really difficult questions, some of them, because some of them are who did it, and it, the answer is you, Lord. Uh, and even with modern science, many of these things are, are simply not understood. But the key um, thing through all of this is that God is in charge of everything, and God is ultimately wise. So Elihu questioned Job's wisdom, But Job, because he feared God and he turned from evil, uh, he actually uh, was wise in that sense. Maybe one more thing I might mention is if you look at this in the light of the rest of the Bible, there are lots of references to Job in bits of the Bible where you might not expect them. So um, rich man and uh, Lazarus, you remember that story? Well, it's about a rich man. And who's covered with sores? Not the rich man. It's Lazarus who's covered with the sores. And people are coming and looking. And so it actually takes all sorts of things from the book of Job like that. You'll find references throughout the Bible. Okay, have we got any questions in yet? Where was us? So us is mentioned in Jeremiah 25. I think um, I should have prepared the reference here. Um, and you'll see it next to a whole load of other places. So that really helps uh, for locating it. So what we'll find in Genesis, uh, uh, Jeremiah 25 verse 20 all the mixed tribes among them, the kings of the land of Uz and the kings of the land of the Philistines and so on. Um, it seems to be that Uz is out towards the east and he's the greatest of the children or the sons of the east. Now there is one interpretation of that is that simply people who live in the east. Another interpretation of that is you think of Genesis 25. Genesis 25, um, Abraham took Keturah after Sarah had died to be his wife And it says he had sons through her, and he sent all his sons other than Isaac off to the east. So there's lots of people descended from there. The other thing is we know Bildad and Zophar and, um, um, sorry, the Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, and the Amathite, and what's my third one? Uh, Zophar. Uh, They they all came, we know roughly where they came from. So it's, it's out, you know, probably in Jordan. Yeah. Okay, we've got, we've got several that have come in now, uh, 10 or 12. So explain Leviathan. Uh, this person, Scott, says, I've heard it explained as a dinosaur. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, um, okay, Leviathan is a name we get um, quite a bit in the Bible, and uh, I'm not entirely sure, but we'll, we'll, we'll work out what we can say from the Bible. So Leviathan uh, has 
uh, is, a, is in the water. So there are ichthyosaurs that are in the water, or were, uh, not dinosaurs, are, are land creatures. And I want you to notice a key thing about um, Leviathan, who gets the most space. And that is that Leviathan, um, in the very last verse, it talks about Leviathan. This is Job 41, verse 34. He is king over all the sons of pride. That Leviathan is the ultimate king, and who's in charge of him? God. And that's a really important thing that, that, we, that we get, that however big any beast is, God's in charge of it. But there's another thing, that, and that is that when um, this is written in Hebrew, when it's translated into Greek, the words behemoth, behemoth, and the word Leviathan get translated at, in, as beast and dragon, respectively. Beast and dragon. Well, you know that they come up in the book of Revelation, don't they? And the point is, doesn't matter whether it's on the land or in the sea, um, God's in charge. And um, I just say, um, we should look at Isaiah, or you say Isaiah in your language, sorry. Um, Isaiah chapter 27 and uh, verse <clears throat> 1. In that day, the Lord, with his, hard, with, uh, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. So there are some times in which I think Leviathan was a creature, a real creature, but there's also a symbolism as well as the reality, uh, which is that he, he speaks of Satan. Now, if the book of Job is showing that God's in charge and Satan, you know, if I can say, is on a leash, it's exactly the same with Leviathan. Does that make sense? So, um, I, I believe uh, in a recent creation. Um, I don't, don't know what you believe here, but I, that seems to me the clearest teaching from, from, from the Bible, that, that things were created by God recently. Therefore, I believe that, uh, you know, dinosaurs and so on are part of God's uh, creation, and, and, and they've, di they've, they've died out uh, since then. So, I've got no problem with there being a reference to a you know, uh, any creature like that in the, in the book of Job. Uh, that, that could well be the case. Not completely sure, but I'm saying there's a, there's, it's a real thing. And there's also a picture of the power of Satan there as well. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, several questions having to do with Satan showing up in heaven and having this conversation with God. Yep. One of these is explain why Satan was in heaven with the quote-unquote good angels and just kind of your thoughts on what's going yeah, sure. on there. Yeah, sure. So... <laughs> When someone begins a question, explain why. Remember, they're asking a why question, and Job asked, asked a why question. Now, most why did God questions simply can't be answered. Because if God has, how much wisdom does God have? Oh, infinite wisdom. How much knowledge do we have? Uh, well, let's try and do the ratio between God's wisdom and ours. Um, we, you know, we've got 0 0.0, no, 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 no. No, we can't use a one at any point, can we? Because uh, that would be underestimating under God's knowledge. So if that's the case, we don't actually expect an answer to a why. Now, what we do have is a very clear teaching that God is holy, God's separate. And so the puzzle, you know, for Satan being in God's presence is how can that be the case uh, if God's holiness is pure? But then we do know, the Bible does teach us that there's more than one type of God's presence. There's the presence that he has everywhere upholding everything and in that sense even someone who is in hell is in God's presence and yet you know you will also have that um, sometimes it will also talk of hell as away from his presence you have both in the bible because they're they're both true that someone in pre in, in in hell is away from his favorable presence and his joyful presence, but they are still within um, the parameters of God's sovereignty. And so, I don't, I mean, so I'm going to um, sort of try and describe what's it mean, Satan being in heaven? Well, it means that there's a conversation going on. Heaven, there's a danger that we thought of heaven as a space in which God sits. Impossible, because God is bigger than heaven. 
right? So, you know, we mustn't think of heaven as like this space, and how on earth did he get invited into the party? So, you know, God's really hard to understand. But he's the most interesting person there is to understand. Wonderful, we can think about him all our lives and eternity and explore more and more. So, really we're asking, how is it possible for the sovereign Lord to have a conversation with his a, a, a fallible creature? Well, the same, same way as it's possible for us to pray. God's able to talk to us without it compromising uh, his holiness. God's able to talk to Satan. Um, and, and so that conversation... Uh, is, is going on. Uh, does that make sense? Well, it doesn't have to make total sense. I mean, just does it make some, you know, does it, does it give you some insight? Okay, good. Is there a way to differentiate, or if that's a, that makes sense between God allowing and God causing? Yes. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Um, Already in Job, we've noticed that in Job chapter 2, um, God says to Satan, you incited me against him. So it was described in Job both as Satan doing it and God describes it as him doing it. You see? But Satan was doing it maliciously and God was, I think, allowing it. So let's go to Matthew chapter 25 because I think there's a key uh, set of principles uh, here. Um, Matthew chapter 25, we have uh, the sheep and the goats, you remember, uh, at the end of time, and there is uh, the, the king, Jesus, sitting on the throne. And this is what it says, when the Son of Man, Matthew 25, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's what he says to the sheep. What does he say to the goats? Verse 41, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now I want you to notice the differences between those. One is... To one group, he says, come. To the other group, he doesn't say depart. He says, depart from me. So there's a, a, a phrase of separation. Depart from me. To one group, he says, you who are blessed by my father. To the other group, he doesn't say, you, are, you who are cursed by my father. He says, you who are cursed. You see the difference? One is blessed by my father. The other group is cursed. And it doesn't say by my father. Now, that's a, something that happens throughout the Bible. It will sometimes say that God curses, but statistically, in numbers of times, there are far more times it will say God blesses than God curses. And very often, um, the, the, it, it will drop God's name off there because it's wanting to separate God a bit more from a curse than from a blessing. Does that make sense? Um, and then it says this. To one group, it says this. To the kingdom prepared for you. To the other group, it says... Uh, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, there's a big difference. One group's going to what was prepared for them. Another group was going to what was prepared for another group. See? And then, to the first group, he says, to what was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And the other group, it's prepared for the devil and his angels without a foundation of the world. So you notice not just what is said, but what is not said. Right? This is a sort of asymmetry that's happening all the time in the Bible. I think there are eight different ways of marking it. I, I will try and remember most of those, but I probably won't be able to remember all of those. Where God is differentiating between things that he uh, is involved in. Uh, you know, God doesn't stand in an equal relationship to everything that happens on earth. So God's sovereign over everything. He's king over everything. But he doesn't stand in an equal relationship. Let me explain. Luke tells us, that there's joy in heaven over people, who, sinners who repent. God also tells us in Ezekiel that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So we know there are things that God enjoys and the things that he doesn't enjoy. That's one difference. Then you'll have things that he's actively portrayed as doing and things that he's passively allowing. You'll have things where he is, uh, there's a passive plus an agent prepared, uh, blessed by my father, passive, without an agent, cursed, 
without Abba, my father. You have things that he does via a means or something not like that. You have things that he does and it's said to be before the foundation of the world and things that are not said to be for, for the foundation of the world. Now, I'm, I'm going to tread on dangerous territory because I have no idea what you think about predestination here. Okay, so I'm just going to launch in, but I'm okay because I'm not on that dangerous territory because I'm pretty sure um, the scriptures teach clearly on this. Some people think that when you have the word predestined, that then can refer to everything. No, the Bible uses the word predestined for particular things. So you will find every time it's using that pre, something happens before the foundation of the world, it's to do with salvation. See, so in other words, God is really, really active and really loves getting involved in salvation and giving life. Why? Because he is the living God and life is sharing part of him. Death and sin are the antithesis of who he is. So there are all of these things that he enjoys and really is active about, and there are things that he, in the words of Romans, bears with much long-suffering. So in other words, he doesn't stand in equal relationship to everything that happens. So we look at, say, you know, the recent you know, um, storm, Harvey, and other storms that uh, uh, come on, and clearly they're within God's sovereignty, and clearly we have no way of answering the why question any more than Job could answer the why question. Uh, you know, the, 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 the reasons God may have for something, you know, it's just vast. But then you look at the tragedy that happens in someone's life and, and the sin and, and so on, and we've got to say, God dislikes that sin. He dislikes seeing death. He doesn't take any pleasure in the suffering and so on. So we understand essentially God's heart. The Bible has loads and loads of ways of portraying God's heart as God who loves life, loves salvation, and hates death and hates sin. And so this is, and it's portrayed in all these different ways so that ordinary Bible readers can intuitively pick it up. They just get it. As they read God, they get a sense of his heart. So that's my sort of long answer to that. That was pretty good, but it may be too much for the short time. I'll give you an easy one, and then I'll give you the hard one and see what you want to do. The easy one, someone's just asking kind of, well, what is your uh, preferred English translation? Okay, <laughs> So you might give us your second and third as well, because yeah. i got to assume so, the ESV is up there. I'm on the English Standard Version Committee, but what I would say is the best English translation to use is the one that you actually use. You know, I mean, that's, as it, I want people to use it. Um, <laughs> you know... People sometimes say, what's the best one to have on my shelf? You know, uh, and, and so I actually really love the King James Version as well. I, th I think it's amazing. And I'm not saying you should use it to reach out to young kids today. I'm just saying that there's a value in what C.S. Lewis said, when you read a new book, read books from different generations. And the reason why is they had blind spots too, but they had different blind spots. So the nice thing about a translation made 400 years ago is it wasn't made in an age of skepticism. The bad thing is that it had 400 years less discovery. <laughs> you know, so there's good um, you know, with old translations as well. Sorry, yeah. Okay, so Matthew 25. Yep. I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, no pun intended the, in, on the hot seat because a question in Matthew 25 about hell. So there's kind of a raging debate now about the more traditional view, eternal conscious torment. Yes. Um, and I think this relates to the problem of suffering, and some yep. unbelievers struggle with that idea. And then there are some that are annihilationists and universalists. Kind of, what do you see, not, I mean, your personal, but where do you see the text leading you these yep. days? So it seems to me that when Jesus is talking about uh, hell uh, or, or Gehenna as a place where the fire uh, does, isn't quenched and the, uh, and, the, and the worm doesn't die. He is trying to scare the people listening. And that scaring works not when they think, oh, the worm doesn't die, but my body might. The scare, or, or the fire's going to go on, but I'm not going to be in pain. No, the scaring only works if you think, wow, that might be me. Now, most of the objections to hell are, what about that person? What about the person who's never heard? What about the kid? You know, and so on. Their um, appeals about the justice. Now, let's face it. All of the warnings about hell are given to adults who are currently hearing. <laughs> right? So, the what about the other person? Mind your own business. <laughs> you know, 
Jesus was approached in Luke 13, and someone said, are there few who are saved? The answer was, make sure you are saved. You know, the guy comes along with a theoretical, theological question. Is it many or few? You know, and he's told, strive you to make sure you enter. So I want to say, the objection on the justice of God, hell can't be fair, is a complete red herring. And the reason why is because hell by definition is fair. The thing we need to front when we're talking to people is God is completely fair. That, by the way, it's a very scary thing that the measure we've used on others, he's going to use on us. Or in Romans 2, that, that he's going to use our own consciences and say, look, your conscience said this. So God wants not only to be fair, but to be seen to be fair. So at the final judgment, no one's going to walk away saying, hey, that's not fair. No, God, for his own glory, wants to be seen to be fair. So that's going to be a public demonstration of his fairness. So in that sense, um, the, the objection about, you know, what about uh, this other person and, and, and so on, I, I, th I think is completely wrong. Um, we're going into areas the Bible doesn't talk about. So, you know, I, I think don't get drawn into this idea that because we, we, we're, we're against abortion, we're pro-life, we want to say humans are there from conception, that we then have to start dealing with the questions that God deals with, with what does that mean for that eternal human? God is going to be completely fair, and it's very clear that when you're hearing the message, you know, there's only two options, either eternal heaven or eternal hell. And, for, and, and the reason we need to tell other people about the message you haven't yet heard is because they will also come under uh, eternal judgment as well if, if they don't respond. So I think that's uh, what I'd say, and yeah, thanks very much. And we're looking forward to hearing you at second service. I'll pray over you in just a second. I did want to introduce Michael Boston, who is the development guy at American Friends of Tyndale House and newly starting there. And if you would like to help support this wonderful ministry, you can talk to Michael, you can talk to Peter, uh, Jack Hodge, our own. Where's Jack, by the way? Jack. Jack, Jack, Jack. Yeah, Jack. Talk to Jack as well. He knows what's going on. Uh, but we're so grateful that uh, for y'all and the work that you do supporting Peter and the work at, at Tyndale House. Let's pray and We'll close out our time. Father, th thank you for your word. Thank you for being the who, who is at the center of what we seek. You are the way. You are the truth. You're the life. And we turn our lives over to you. And, Father, we pray for those who are seeking, for those who are questioning, that they will find their answers not in necessarily logic or deduction or that they'll find their answers in you, in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for Peter. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for all of the good work that goes on in Cambridge at Tyndale House. And we pray that your blessing will cover them as they continue to work with the sacred texts and inform us about those. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.